How are you all doing today? And I didn't, <laughs> I didn't realize I was being an answer to prayer. Um, but I always believe, I, I believe a lot in uh, icebergs. You know, you can only see like the tip of the iceberg. So when I hear somebody, you know, someone calls me like, you know, the, the day before I think, you know, something, something didn't go well. So <laughs> it, this is probably, there's probably a crisis underneath there. But um, yeah, but no, I'm always, I'm always happy to be able to uh, step in and uh, help at the last minute. I think some people are really bothered by like chaos and things like that. I grew up in a family of nine kids um, with one bathroom. Uh, so uh, there's often, often last minute <laughs> emergencies <laughs> that uh, you had to hurry along. Um, but I wanted to talk today, um, the title, Bearing Burdens and Carrying Loads, is, it's a, it's a uh, title about uh, uh, boundaries. And I don't know um, how many of you, have, how many of you have read the book Boundaries by Cloudon Townsend? It's a really good book. If you get a chance to read it, um, it's written by uh, two Christian psychologists and um, really, really good stuff in there. A lot of, a lot of good, um, you know, biblical input and stuff. Uh, but I want to start with the Ten Commandments. Uh, but before we, before we do, let's, uh, if we could have a word of prayer. Uh, Father in heaven, I uh, just pray that you'd be with uh, uh, my words. Uh, help me to uh, speak, uh, um, not of myself, but um, at the prompting of your Holy Spirit. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so if you look in the Ten Commandments, uh, there in uh, Exodus 20, there's this verse in uh, verse 5. It says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them. So it's talking about idols. So, you know, if we go back to verse 3. Well, actually, no. Well, let's start with, the, start with verse 2. You know, God speaks these things. He says, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I am the Lord, uh, for I, I the Lord thy God am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. And uh, so, you know, th this verse... You know, it, it talks about God being a jealous God, and it, it's hard to describe God using words that apply to people, you know, but the, I think the, the word jealous, I looked it up, uh, I was reading up on it, and it, and it means uh, kind of like a zeal, uh, you know, when you're, you have a, a passion for something. And it, it made me think about my dad. One time, it was right when my voice had changed, and uh, my dad was working out of town. He was working in Toledo, Ohio and we lived in uh, Michigan. And so he was working there and then he would only come home on the weekends. And one day he called and my voice had changed and he didn't know that. And uh, so he, he called and uh, I was like, hello? And he goes, who is this? <laughs> and I never, I never heard that kind of a tone in my dad's voice, but uh, the sudden jealousy, I'm like, wait a minute, well, who is this man in my house? Uh, you know, it, it was just, uh, that was really something. But I think that's, captures something about God's jealousy for us that like he wants us to himself and when we prioritize things that aren't God uh, you know that that kind of provokes a jealousy and it's interesting that it says that he visits the iniquity under the third and fourth generation of them that hate him and uh, you know visiting it onto the children and I, I always thought like again when we think about this in terms of of human wisdom and the way we think about things as people this sounds really petty. It sounds like God's just this petty creature that is, is mad at you, and it's like, well, I'm so mad, I'm gonna, I'll punish you and your children and your children's children, you know, and, um, but I, I think when we, when we look at what does it mean visiting the iniquity under the third and fourth generation, and that word iniquity can also be translated the consequence of or the punishment for a sin, and so it's not God that has to punish us. It's like that is what will happen. It's like he's describing what will happen if we have bad habits and they continue and we don't fix them. They will just, they will just carry on to the next generation. Our kids will observe us and then they will carry it out because they think it's normal. Um, I remember, um, I'm not married anymore, but I remember uh, 
uh, we used to fight all the time about me sleeping on the couch. She didn't like me sleeping on the couch. And I, I, I remember um, one thing in marriage counseling, you know, we, we did that was a really interesting activity, and it was, uh, uh, what was your family's Ten Commandments? Because every family's got a different Ten Commandments of things that thou shalt not do. And uh, in her family, your dad would always say, you know, this isn't a flop house. You have a bed. Go sleep in your bed. You don't sleep on the couch. But in a family of nine kids, you know, there wasn't enough beds for all of us in that house. So we just had to sleep. It was like almost like you were a raccoon with sleeping places. You had to scavenge and look for a place that you could curl up, you know, uh, the favorite place in the winter was behind the wood stove because it was so nice and warm back there. Uh, but you just have to find a place to sleep. But some, so anyway, so sometimes we, we, we break a, a rule uh, that's somebody else's rule. But God has a, a set of principles that these are the law of the universe. Okay, these are the, the principles that you, you can't violate them without a consequence happening. Uh, so... So when it says, you know, those that hate me, I want to talk about that word hate, uh, you know, because it, it says that Jacob loved Rachel, but he hated Leah. And yet, out of his 12 sons, he had six of them with Leah. So obviously it wasn't so bad. Uh, but, uh, but it says that he hated Leah. And uh, there's also that verse that, uh, Je where Jesus says, unless you hate your father and mother, uh, you cannot be my disciple. And there's a translation in, in, uh, in Matthew 10:37. It says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So there's a, there's a feeling of, of uh, that when you, when the Bible is using the word hate in terms of relationships, it's like a person that's one step down. Uh, from another person. So, um, you know, you love them a little bit less uh, because the, you know, God takes priority. And, you know, I think we've all heard that, you know, God should take priority and then your wife and then your children. Um, and so I think that, you know, forms a good hierarchy. And whenever we, we mess that up, um, and that's something, that's a, a concept I never really understood, you know, until, uh, you know, I don't know if you, hopefully none of you have ever, uh, ever had something like this happen to you, um, you know, where uh, there's a, another, another person uh, finds their way into your relationship and then uh, someone tells you, oh, well, I love you both. <laughs> it's like, that's where, that's where that verse really hit home to me. Like, man, that feels like hate <laughs> when you're number, when you're number two, you know, oh, I, I love you both, you know. But anyway, uh, so th there's this concept of, of love uh, love and hate in the Bible that's not the, quite the same way that we use it. So when we, when we deprioritize God, we love him less than something else, that thing is going to take priority, and there are going to be consequences of that. And so, um, so this is kind of leading up to what, I, what I, the sermon is actually about, is about bearing burdens and carrying loads. So if you go to Galatians chapter 6, uh, the scripture reading for today, uh, it talks a lot about boundaries in this, in this scripture, okay? So Galatians 6 says, Brethren, uh, if a man be overtaken in a fault, uh, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meek meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Uh, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if, the, if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then he, uh, shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. This is a little, it sounds a little bit contradictory. So it says in the, in the second verse, bear ye one another's burdens. And, and by doing so, you will fulfill the law of Christ. But then in verse 5, it says, every man shall bear his own burden. And so how do you square that circle? How do you figure that out? And if you look at the original translation, you know, the original uh, Greek, the word that's translated burden there, the, so both of these words are the word burden in English. And it's because there was not, there's not the same, there's not the same, uh, you know, nuance or translation um, from the original. But the word that gets translated burden in verse 2 uh, is a word for like boulder. It's like a very heavy weight, 
very big thing that's like almost immovable. Uh, it's something that will crush you. That's, that's what we have in verse 2. And then the word in uh, verse 5 that's translated burden is a word like uh, more like um, a knapsack or a backpack, something you, you should be able to carry on your own. Okay, so, um, so that's where, you know, that's where the boundaries, that's where boundaries come in. And so the reason I, I lead up with, you know, generational sin is there are, there are things that, that run their course all the way down through the generations. And one of the biggest problems I see and that I've seen in my own life and in and, and the lives of my friends and family is the problem with boundaries. The problem where it, it's not clear who is responsible for something, where someone is taking responsibility for someone else's problem that isn't their problem, someone won't take responsibility for their own problems that are their problem, and then some people who deny that there's a, a, a boundary problem, and families live in sometimes a, a kind of chaos when there are, are not proper boundaries where it's not clear what's the boulder and what's the backpack. And you see this all the time, and I, I don't wanna, I, I don't know any of you, so that, I, that does make me feel better, because uh, I can speak more freely, and if you feel judged by it, well, that's your own problem, because I have no idea who you are, so I'm not talking about you. Um, but you know, I, I know people that like, you know, their, their son or daughter lives with them, doesn't pay rent, they're in their 30s, don't have jobs, and I just think, like, how did that happen? Like, that is crazy. And like, whenever I, I see something like that, I've got, because uh, I, I work in insurance and financial advising and stuff, and I'll be talking with a, a client, and, a, and I, I see that their, their son or daughter is there, and, um, and I'm like, D what does he do? Oh, he doesn't have a job. Oh, wh what did he do before he lost his job? Oh, he hasn't ever had a job. And I think, what? You know, but that's clearly a, a, a case where it's like, you know, your backpack, which is like having a place to live, having a job, paying the lights, you know, those are your backpack. That is your thing, because it says every man should bear his own burden. Uh, and, um, you know, but, it's a, but the, the word in verse two says, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Because it says in, in the first verse, you know, brethren, if, if a man be overtaken in a fault or overtaken in a sin, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. So you see someone struggling in sin, you, you try to bear their burden, you know? And I, I've had a, a, number of, a number of my siblings that have uh, struggled with alcoholism and uh, are in various stages of recovery. One, one of my brothers is, is now recovered for 11 years. And man, you wanna talk about a, that is a boulder uh, to carry when somebody is, is in recovery. And uh, bearing with them, you know, while I remember, I'll never forget what my brother said. He's, he was like, uh, how do you deal with this? How do you deal with life? And I was like, what do you mean life? Life is a pretty big word, you know, what does that mean? Because, ah, you know, coworkers being idiots and bosses being stupid and bills and all these other things. I'm, I'm like, that's just life. <laughs> that's just part of life. You, but, you know, he, he never had to deal with that because he'd just, like, get drunk and then punch it downfield. And then, okay, I don't have to deal with that. I'll just deal with it tomorrow. Oh, I'll deal with it tomorrow. Oh, I'll deal with it tomorrow. You know, but uh, that process of, like, you know, starting to pick up those things, uh, it, take, it takes a while. So sometimes we have to bear one another's burdens. Sometimes we might have to have, uh, you, know, you know, help someone out financially or help someone out with something that they're struggling with. And then there's other things that it's, it's uh, every man should bear his own burden. If you look in uh, 2 Thessalonians 3.10, and I think farmers really understand this verse. Um, we've got a lot of farmers here. Uh, For even when, you, when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. <laughs> You know, it's like that, that hay is not going to harvest itself. <laughs> Those crops are not going to get out of the field on their own. It's going to require some, some energy, you know, kind of injected into the system. And, uh, and so, you know, that's another clear line of boundaries. You know, we have, we have just a problem in this country of boundaries. We're, and, and, prob and the thing about problems in the, in the country, they, they trickle down all the way to the family. Uh, so... So I want to talk about what, what is a boundary, okay? Because a, a lot of times we, we talk about things and we don't even know what they mean. So a boundary is, uh, is a, 
a, a, is like a, a fence or a wall around something. And if you violate it, there are consequences. That's a boundary. Without consequences, it's not really a boundary. We have a lot of laws on the books in America that are not enforced. And so, um, like, you know, for example, you're not supposed to be able to buy cigarettes under the age of 18. You're not supposed to be able to smoke cigarettes when you're under the age of 18. But, you know, how many of us know someone who started smoking before they were 18? Did they ever get arrested for it? You know, that'd be kind of a funny thing to see if, you know, like a teenager smoking and a police officer came out of nowhere and, hey, stop there, and they handcuff them and <laughs> take the cigarettes away. It's like the, the police have bigger problems, so then they just kind of ignore it. And so now it's like we have this law that doesn't really do anything other than inconvenience people when they're trying to, you know, buy cigarettes and whatever, but it's, it obviously doesn't stop anybody. So it's not really a law. There was also a law, I thought this was really interesting, I was looking up laws that were on the books that are no longer, uh, um, that th this one got a appealed late, uh, recently actually, by Governor Whitner, Whitmer, uh, and uh, it was 1931 that uh, men and women uh, living together without being married, that you could get a misdemeanor and a fine of a thousand dollars, and I looked at I looked that up. That was that's a nineteen thousand seven hundred fifty-two dollar and seventy-seven cents in today's dollars. So I thought, wow, that's pretty, pretty. That's a pretty steep penalty. And you think about how many people today, you know, live together before they get married, and that's another boundary problem, right? It's like I I know I know people that. They, they lived together for 10 years, and then they finally got married, and then they got a divorce a year later. Um, and I, I look at that, and I think, like, that is a problem of boundaries, because, you, and you'll, you'll hear people say, what do they say? It's just a piece of paper. They always say that. It's oh, just a piece of paper. That's just a piece of paper. That's just what it is. And it's like, well, if it was just a piece of paper, you'd sign it. You know, so clearly it's not a piece of paper. It's like he, it's like a guy doing that is like living in this weird Peter Pan world where he gets to be a boy forever and he never has to grow up. He never has to accept responsibility for a family. He never has to publicly say to the world, hey, this is my wife. I'm going to choose her and she's going to be with me until the very end. And we're going to go off on this adventure into the world and we're going to, we're going to, um, you know, take on the world together. Uh, we're going to bail hay together. <laughs> we're going to raise children together. You know, uh, you didn't, you didn't, you probably didn't know that when you're, you know, si what you're getting signed on for, you know, but that's, that's what, that's what, you know, marriage when it's working, that's what it is. But w when people say that kind of stuff, you know, ah, it's just a piece of paper. It's like, uh, that is such a weaselly thing for a man to say, and just like being such a weasel. You know, now there's a, I don't know if you've ever heard of this thing um, online. There's a movement called MGTOW. Have you ever heard of this? It's MGTOW, it's men going their own way. And so it's these men that are saying, well, a lot of people get divorced and then the women take half your stuff so you should never marry a woman. Don't live with her long enough to be considered common law marriage and don't have children with her and just check out of Western society and just play video games and you know, pursue your own selfish desires and don't start a family. And again, it's another weaselly thing. It's such a weaselly thing because like, yeah, you're right. Divorce can be bad, but also, you know, that's part of that's part of society is having rules, having boundaries, having a, a relationship that is defined, and that you know what can happen in the relationship and what cannot. And so, without a without a uh, without a boundary, it it's just a it's like you know we. We want freedom, we want unlimited freedom, and there, there isn't freedom without responsibility. You have to have some responsibilities for something, and then you get freedom with it. Um, so, you know, we got, we got to have a, some, some rules around it. And, uh, you know, we're made in the image of God. You know, God is a God of order. Uh, he, he has, he has a, a, a difference between day and night. He has a difference between the ground and the sky. He has a difference between, you know, righteousness and unrighteousness. And um, so, so I, I see this in parenting. I see this in my own parenting, and I, I, I you know, I, I know my, my kids will attest to this, but, you know, if you, 
a boundary without a consequence isn't a boundary. And I know I've seen so many parents, and I've done this myself, where I'm like, hey, stop that, stop that. No, no, don't do that. No, no, no. And it's like you're, you're training your kids to treat you like an alarm clock with a snooze button. It's like I don't know how long I've done that, and it's still something, you know, I didn't learn growing up, so it's, this has been a, a, a difficult process for me, grow, you know, as, as I as I grow and, and mature. But that if if you tell someone no, and there's not a consequence, that no doesn't mean anything. It's like it's just a word. And kids are desperate for structure. They want structure. They want to know. I mean, that's part of the job of a child is to test the boundaries, like a raptor. You know, which what's the weakest area of the fence? And they want to find out where the, where the boundary is. And once they find the boundary, they go, ah, shoot. Well, I really wanted to be able to do whatever I wanted, but I guess I can't, you know. And uh, if you don't tell your kids no and enforce a consequence, the police will be the first people to do that, you know. You see these people that they, they fight with a police officer. I think, like, who's going to win, <laughs> you know? You know, who's going to win? You know, you're, the best, best you got for you is a blaze of glory, you know, as you ride off in the sunset, you know. Like, that's not going to happen. You're, you're going to hit a wall, and the police officers are going to be the wall for a lot of people, you know. And, and that, again, you know, we go back to marriage. You know, marriage is just, we, you know, we, in the 1980s, we made, it, we, we made all these rules about uh, no-fault divorce. It's like you can get a divorce for any and every reason. I'm not happy anymore. So that's a good enough reason to break up the family. And then people don't have families that stick together. And then you've got uh, kids that are raised in homes without fathers. Uh, and that's not, it's not good because that's one of the, you know, again, like we need a, a, a father and a mother. A mother has like a, kind of a physiological bond with their child. You know, I don't know if you know this about, uh, you know, uh, during labor and during uh, nursing, there's a chemical released called oxytocin. And oxytocin is a bonding hormone. It makes you bond with someone. Uh, and so there's a reason why, you know, mother needs to bond with their, with their baby. You know, if mother, mother doesn't bond with a baby, that's big trouble, right? Um, but did you know that testosterone blunts the effectiveness of oxytocin? Like, it, it is produced in males, but, um, you know, testosterone is like, uh, I read a statistic, it's like 13 to 16 times more testosterone in a male body than a woman's body. So... Testosterone is actually blunting the effectiveness of the bond. So the bond that a father have, has with his children is very different. And I'll tell you a story about this. I remember when uh, my son was sleep training, uh, you know, because he didn't know how to go to sleep. And uh, it was bad, it was bad. It was like six, seven months in, and he would not sleep. And we were new parents. We didn't know what we were doing. He, sometimes he'd pass out at 11 o'clock at night. because He's a little baby. He doesn't know what time it is. So he finally pass out. And then because he's so sleep dep deprived, he'd wake up screaming, you know, like two hours later and confused, you know. And uh, I was working on a graduate paper, uh, and I was, I was sitting there typing away at this thing. I was, it was like 2 in the morning. I, I was like, I got to finish this, you know. And I'm, I'm so sleep deprived. I think I didn't sleep for like two days. And, uh, well, you know, when I say two days, you know, there was like maybe an hour of sleep and then a screaming baby and then, you know, two hours of sleep and a screaming baby, you know. But anyway, so I, I finally, you know, I'm, I'm working on it and uh, my wife at the time, she suggested, oh, you should write this in the paragraph. And I was like, oh, that's a great idea. And then I look around and I'm like, there's no one in the room. <laughs> I'm like half awake and like half asleep, you know, I'm, I'm delusional. But I remember uh, someone was like, well, you need to just let him cry it out. He's got to learn how to sleep some, somehow. And, um, and, uh, his, his mom couldn't do it. She couldn't do it. It, it. You know, the crying, screaming baby, and, you know, there's physiological, like, stress response, and, you know, her, her palms start sweating, or, or, you know, she just, you know, was so stressed out by it. And I said, you got to go for a walk. Just go for a walk, and I'll, I'll make sure I watch him. The pediatrician said he could sleep for, he could scream for 45 minutes. So after 45 minutes, then you got a problem. And uh, he screamed like bloody murder for like 43 minutes. It was, it was unreal. Um, like just, just screamed and then on minute, I'm, I looked at the time, I was like, oh gosh, this is long, 43 minutes. And then he, uh, 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 and then he, and then he went to sleep. I checked on him. And eventually I, I, I got to the point where, you know, I, you know, cause uh, children are different. You know, every, every ch child is a little different, but you know, the, some babies want to be held all the time. And then you know, as soon as you set them down, they start screaming. They're really upset that you're not holding them. And then uh, other kids, you know, they don't want you to hold them so much. But um, I remember it got to the point where 
he knew that he knew the, the the game you know it's like i i set him down he started crying i shut the door there was a click i made sure there was a loud click on the door crying would stop you know well i guess dad's put me to bed time to go to sleep you know but anyway there's a there's a reason there's a reason that we 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 have these differences you know um and uh we have these you know we ha we need men in in uh, in homes because uh because with with the mother the baby is always right and it needs to be that way or otherwise we probably none of us would have survived if the mom wasn't there to take care of us and make sure that we didn't die in the first four years of our life because i gosh i remember the times one of my sons was like climbing around on the counter digging around in the cupboards i was like it's quiet <laughs> and i look over there there he is but you know we need but we need both and i feel like our society is having just a total breakdown because we we've got uh We've got, uh, you know, uh, women raising kids by themselves. Dads aren't involved. There's totally unclear boundaries. Uh, but anyway, um, so uh, yeah. So a boundary is you you say you say, hey, this is not okay. And if this happens, you know, we're in trouble. And I think a lot of times we, when we read the Bible, we think about Jesus as this like soft, cuddly teddy bear who just rolls over at every opportunity and it's just like, you know, you know, if someone slaps you on the right cheek, you turn to them the other also. Um, and, uh, you know, if you, if you, but that's not, that's not biblical. If you look at John 18 verses 22 and 24, uh, Jesus was not like that. He had boundaries. Uh, and, and when, so, so Jesus has, uh, has said something and then one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand and, ans and saying, you know, answerest thou the high priest so? How can you talk to him like that? Uh, and Jesus answered him, if I've spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if, I, if well, why smitest thou me? And then he sent, you know, they sent Jesus away bound to the, the high priest. But Jesus spoke up and he did not just let people do horrible things and say nothing. You know, but he called them out on it. And now that, and that, that word is, has a power to convict the people around them because they can see, wow, this person, they, they don't have a reason for why they struck him. So Jesus didn't just roll over on that. Um, so yeah, we have to have boundaries with our kids. We have to be able to tell our kids no. We have to have consequences for when they don't. Also, friends and family, we have to, we have to you know, have a, a, a boundary with them as well. You know, Proverbs uh, 25, 29, 25 uh, is another verse, because I, I've struggled with for this for a long time in my life, is fear of people, you know, fear of man. If you're afraid of someone, you won't stick up for yourself. And you're, you're, uh, you're worried about getting their approval. You're worried about, oh, well, I don't want to do this because then somebody will be, will be mad at me. Uh, in verse, uh, verse 25 of Proverbs 29, it says, fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. So when you fear people, it isn't good. And um, it, will, it will lead you to do things that you know are wrong and you know you are betraying yourself, you know you're lying to yourself, you know, and you, you will just go along with it because you're afraid of people's disapproval. Another verse um, about that is uh, Matthew 20, Matthew 10, 28. Uh, and that's where Jesus says, uh, Fear not them which can kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both the soul and body in hell. So God is the one who has the power to destroy you. You know, that's the person we should be respecting and fearing and worrying about, well, wow, would this be good? Would God appreciate this? Would God appreciate this? You know, would he be, would this make God jealous? <laughs> you know, that's a person we should be respecting, not the people who really can't do that. The only thing they can do is, is kill the body, uh, but they, they can't control our fate. Um, there's another verse about, about fearing man, and that's Acts uh, 5.29. So if you go there, Acts 5.29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. And those people, the disciples, had, 
had integrated this idea that like we have to be able to stand on our holy ground, we have to stand up for what we believe in, and we're not going to let the fear of disappointing or angering or whatever other people uh, rather than men. And um, it's not easy. It's, it's really not easy. But it, I think a lot of times we think about that verse and we're always looking at, at boundaries and standing your ground and sticking up for yourself. We're always looking at that in this kind of big epic sense, like this big thing where there's going to be a showdown and you're going to be in court before the Sanhedrin and they're going to ask you, will you deny Jesus? And you're going to say, no, I stand on my, stand on my, the, on, you know, my word, you know, and I'm not going to back down. And we think about it in that big epic sense. And yet there are all these like little, little things all the time where we compromise ourselves and we lie, we say we're fine when we're not fine, uh, we, we tolerate behavior from our children that makes us dislike them and annoyed with them, and we say, oh, that's fine, you know, it's fine, everything is fine. Uh, people offend us and, and do things repeatedly that bother us and we just smooth it over and we ignore it and we don't stick up for ourselves. It's all these like little, little things. And so, um, you know, it's very, it's very, very tough and I, I can only, I can only speak from my own experience, and I'll, I'll, I'll end with this, um, but you know, like with my, uh, with my brother, when he was getting sober, I remember one of the worst things uh, that I ever had to do was like tell him, no, you can't live with me. Because he, he, I remember he got his tax return, and he said, you know, ah, you know, uh, I, he was about to get his tax return, and I said, hey, come live with me, I'll take the money, I'll hold on to it, I'll find you an apartment, you'll be able to get back on your feet. And he said, uh, you know, oh, I, I, I think I'll be fine. And then, you know, all the money's gone. He blew the money. And then he's like, well, I need a place to live. And I'm like, N no, like that was going to be like a two week thing. You could, I, I would have, we, we would have had the money from your tax return to get a new apartment and everything. Um, so no, I can't do, I can't do that. I've got a family. And, and then uh, I felt, I felt guilty about it. And, you know, because that's the thing, if you're a people pleaser, you feel guilty all the time. You're always guilty about, you know, offending people or hurting their feelings. And I remember I, I said, well, okay, you can stay with me, but I need, I need to be able to search all your belongings, and I need to be able to do all that before you move in, et, et cetera. You know, that's the only circumstance I'm okay with this in. And then he said, uh, what is this, Nazi Germany? You're going to try and control me? You can't control me. And it's like, <laughs> it's like, okay. But I remember that was the most painful thing I ever had to do because you want to help someone. You want to help someone, but then, you know, I'm, I'm glad that I did it because I think that was speaking the truth and, and it's now like 11 years, he's, you know, 11 years sober and, and it's like, you know, he was forced to deal with the consequences. And I think that's a lot of the times when we're people pleasers, we're protecting people from the consequences of their bad choices. And it's, it's that's not, we are made in the image of God. We're made in the image of God, and that's not what God does. If you read in Romans 1, you know, what does it say? It says God gave them over to a reprobate mind. If you go there, we can close with this one. Um, yeah, Romans 1, uh, and it's in... It's in verse... 17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it to them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because when they... Uh, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither as were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made it like corruptible man, uh, into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Verse 26, for this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. So God gives you up to your 
bad choices. God doesn't want to force you to do anything. And so then he get, if you want to go to hell in a handbasket, he will let you do that. He will let you destroy yourself. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, I, I, I work, you know, I work in insurance, um, you know, so I'm, I'm working with retirees all the time. And I, I tell the new agents that I'm training, I'm like, this job is like a time machine. You're going to get in, you know, you're getting in my car. You're going to, you're, we're going to go in a time machine. We're going to go and there was a cl uh, potential client that I knew was really successful, had farmed and everything, and we pulled into the driveway, you know, the gorgeous house and everything. Um, you can tell you sacrificed a lot to be able to be, able to be there and, um, and made a lot of good choices and was rewarded for those good choices. And then I said, all right, let's, let's get back in here and we're going to we're going to go in a time machine to somewhere else. <laughs> we're going to, I felt like the, have you ever read the Christmas Carol or seen the movie, you know, or the, the ghost of Christmas past and the ghost of Christmas present? I'm like, follow me, young agent. You know, I will show you, I'll show you something else. And, you know, it was, you know, that another one of those situations where, you know, uh, these people aren't married and they're, you know, the, they say fiance, but the guy, while well, the other ladies in the other room, oh, but, uh, whatever, I guess so. You know, they're like, okay, clearly not, not fiance there. Uh, it's like, oh, I wonder why you guys don't live in the same, same place. Uh, but it's like, you know, you make choices, those choices add up, especially with our health. You know, I, I don't know why we, we don't take better care of ourselves. Um, we only get this one body and uh, we really should take better care of ourselves. I think it's because the Bible says, because the Lord does not avenge speedily, the heart of men is fully set in them to do evil. Because we don't see an immediate consequence, sometimes we're like, ah, oh well, I don't exercise, oh well. You know, and, and yet I, I, watch, I, I watch these people that are my clients, the ones who exercise all the time, well into their 60s and 70s, they're in great shape, they're happy people, they don't have as many health problems. And then I look at myself and I go, when am I going to start doing that? Uh, uh, tomorrow, I'm busy this week. I'll, I'll get, I'll get in shape next. I'll get in shape later. And, um, you know, I had somebody call me skinny fat because my heart rate is really high for a person, for a person in my my age. You know, uh, so don't don't let my skinny frame fool you. Um, I have quite a, quite my share of donuts under my belt. Um, but anyway, so I just want I want to leave you with that. Um, with that thought that you are made in the image of God, God does not prevent people from facing the consequences of their action. You know, he, he has boundaries. You know, Moses struck the rock when he told him to talk to it, and what did, what did God tell Moses? You're not gonna walk into the promised land. You'll still be saved. You know, I'll let you into heaven, but you're not gonna walk into the promised land. And there was a, there was a consequence of that. And I think if you're a people pleaser like me, and I know there's gotta be some of you out there, uh, I encourage you to stand your ground and fight for what you know needs to be done. And in doing it, it will be probably the most challenging and difficult thing that you do in your life to stand up to someone who is mistreating you. Uh, that's probably the, the most difficult thing that you will ever have to do. And in some ways, you're going to feel horribly guilty about it, even though you're doing what's right. Like I said, when I, when I told my brother no, I felt awful. And if you go based on your feelings, you won't do the right thing. You have to do what you know is right. And uh, I want to leave you with this one verse. If you turn to 1 John 3.20, I don't hear this verse quoted enough. You know, so I'll take, uh, take a minute to get there, and then we'll, we'll close with a word of prayer. Um, but I feel like this verse was written for people like me, for people that, you know, if you are a people pleaser, you, my friend said this, I was like, man, that's a good way to look at it. He said, your conscience has a hair trigger. You know, it's like somebody just needs to look at you bad and then you feel guilty. Ah, you know, I feel guilty. I don't want to disappoint someone. And it's like, doesn't take much for somebody to twist the, the screw on you or, you know, I know some people like we were at, speaking of fireworks, you know, we were at the fireworks and I don't know if you know Aaron Cloutier from the Midland Church, but. Uh, but anyway, he parked his car because uh, they, they wanted to park their cars there ahead of time and then I would show up and then I was going to have my car there, but then they were going to go disc golfing and I said, well, 
if you guys do that, then I mean, I'm gonna be without a car because I don't wanna go disc golfing, so I'll just be here, with my kids without a car, so I'm not gonna do that. So then Aaron's like, okay, well, I'll just park on an angle. <laughs> and so he like parked on a weird angle and like took up like three spaces. And I thought, man, I'm, I'm so jealous of that, that Aaron could just do that and not worry about the people he'd offend and, you know, oh my gosh, look at this jerk who parked his car diagonal across three spaces, you know, who would do that? And it's like, he had a good reason and he's like, he's like, oh well, not my problem. <laughs> it, you know, I just, I envy people that are able to kind of say what they want and they don't, they are able to do what they want. But anyway, if you, it's, it's, it's not going to be natural for you to stick up for yourself and stand up for yourself, but um, and to, to make sure there's a consequence to the, the boundaries so that you're not just this person that's nagging people to not annoy you and nagging people to not hurt you and nagging and nagging and, ah, oh, please stop, stop, stop. You know, you have to be able to enforce it. You have to be able to say, if you do this, I'm not going to be a part of this conversation. If you yell at me, I'm going to leave the room. If you, if you, you know, do this again, you know, et, et cetera. There has to be some kind of a consequence. Um, and that's going to be a challenge for you. Uh, but I want to encourage you with uh, 1 John 3.20. It says, For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. So um, that's been a verse that's been very encouraging to me uh, in my, in my uh, journey through adulthood is that sometimes our heart condemns us and says, you know, how could you do that? How could you be a Christian and do that? You're not, you're, you're not being kind enough. You're not being a team player enough. You're not, you're not helping people. You're doing the wrong thing. And, you know, you have, to, you have to know what's right, you know, from the Scripture, from God's Word, from other people. Sometimes you have uh, Christian brothers and sisters who are in your life. They're like, that's crazy. I don't know why you allow that. That's kind of insane, you know, and, and you've got to be able to, you know, stand your ground and... Uh, that's not going to be easy, but if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and, and He knows all, and he knows, he knows us deep down that, um, that you know, we're trying to do what's right. So uh, let's close with a word of prayer, uh, if you, uh, you bow your heads with me. Um, Father in heaven, uh, we thank you for giving us consequences. We thank you that, uh, that we cannot just continue in sin, uh, that, that when we do things that are willful and disobedient and uh, sinful and, um, and wrong, that uh, consequences follow. Uh, and just like you uh, kept a, an angel in the, the Garden of Eden, and you wouldn't allow us to eat from the tree of life lest we live forever in sin, uh, I thank you that you watch out for us uh, like a good parent, and that you're consistent with us, uh, and that you are the father that we need in this life to give us an example. And I pray that you watch over all of us as we go through our lives, uh, be with our relationships with our family, with, uh, be with the husbands and wives here uh, in this congregation, be with the, the parents and the children, uh, be with the, the coworkers, uh, be with everything that we, we interact with where we are, we are meant to be a, a house that stands on a hill and to be a person that stands for truth and, and, and righteousness in the world. And uh, I pray that you'd help us to stand up for the right thing um, in, a, in a time that it's difficult, in a time it may not be uh, at the end of time. Uh, it may not be uh, standing before, um, you know, the beast and the false prophet and in some kind of epic situation. It may just be uh, us needing to, to, do, to, to draw a line uh, with someone that's close to us that we, that we love. I pray that you give us strength and courage and uh, help us to uh, live out your, your image within us. And I pray this uh, in the name of Jesus, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.